Welcome to the Hardly Adequate YouTube. This week, both Leo and myself will be stepping through the solutions for the Hardly Adequate 2023 CTF that was built out of Adelaide SEC this year. But before we start, uh, Leo is new to Hardly Adequate, has been working quite a lot as my lead content editor, and it's his first time on the channel. So welcome, Leo. Thanks for joining me. So yeah, just uh, hey to everyone. I'm very new to the industry. Yeah, happy to learn lots. Kind of feeling hardly <laughs> <laughs> right now, yeah. but um, I was waiting to use that. But no, it's it's great to, to kind of be thrown into things that you're not really familiar with, but I'm having a lot of fun. So hopefully, yeah, you all are too with the CTF. <laughs> I, I definitely threw Leo into the, the deep end on this. Like we chucked this together in about four days and I was like, hey, I've got these questions that I think you could put together for me uh, for the general knowledge section. So um, yeah, Leo went and did a whole bunch of research and helped me build a CTF, which was good to have a hand. Otherwise it would have been like 10 questions. But yeah, I think we ended up getting just over 30. So it was, uh, I think a nice length for a beginner CTF. To get started, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna click through all of the challenges. We'll talk through kind of how we would solve them. I know that there were some problems in the CTF that I fixed kind of like on the Friday and Saturday. So when we get to those, I'll talk to that, that as well and what went wrong and, and what I did to fix them. Yeah, we'll just be stepping through one question each, talking through our kind of thought process, how we would Google things, that kind of thing. All right, so jumping straight into it, uh, I'm gonna go with MFT. What does MFT stand for on a Windows system? So we've kind of already got it up here, but if you Googled MFT, you get managed file transfer, which is not the correct answer for this one. So we added, ended up adding, as we went through validation, Windows system to the question which gets you master file table, which is the correct answer for this first question. And so I think we had 26 users doing the CTF. We, we had almost 30 people. So it's like everyone got that, that one. But we'll jump into record type now. Leo, off to you. Uh, this question, which of the following is a DNS record type? A, TTL, B, LDAP, C, PTR, or D, THCP? One of the ways that you could obviously find the answers is Googling um, what those other sort of acronyms are. TTL, um, LDAP, and BHCP aren't DNS record types. In this particular case, it's, uh, yeah, the pointer record. If you just copy and paste the question in Google, it, that, it would tell you that, but it also probably get results, there you go, um, of different sort of DNS records and PTR is not one of them. And I think that was, that was the aim for a lot of our questions. Even the harder ones was to be able to Google it in some way because we, we wanted people to be able to research. All right, so next one, I'm getting all the nice, easy acronyms. I just would Google this, man in the middle. So that that's the answer for number three. I'm not sure, maybe this could have had other acronyms, but if you search for it, it's kind of like first page Google with which no one ever looks past, kind of gives you the answer. Oh, these, these ones you couldn't fail. So we did do, I think we'll see here, yeah. We did do failed attempts. So if you tried to brute force multiple choice, you wouldn't get the points. For this question, which type of network device operates at layer one of the OSI model and requires connected devices to operate at half duplex using CSMA slash CD? Is it A, bridge, B, hub, C, switch, D, router? The answer to this would be um, B, hub because it's the only device among the um, choices there that operates um, at layer one. And the others are either layer two or three. The thing about this question was that is actually the CSMA slash CD is, is just to really confuse in some ways, basically people. You wrote this one and when I was validating this stumped me, I was like, I know it's not C or D because they're not layer one. And then I was just like, I can't remember where a bridge sits. And then I had to Google it. It was a good refresher validating this for me. All right, TikTok. So which protocol is used in the synchronization of clocks between different computer systems of packet switch variable latency data network? So first thing I'm going to do is just Google the question. The other way you could do all these questions is, again, process elimination. So DHCP is where you get your IP address from when you join a network. TFTP is a file transfer protocol. And DNS is what you use for when you're trying to find the IP of a server and you do like a DNS query um, over port 53. So A was the correct answer for this first one. Right, which of the following network protocols is used to send email from one server to another server? Is it A, SNMP, B, RDP, 
C, POP3, OD, SM, TBA. There's only two that are sort of male related sort of protocols that end up be POP3 and which is C or, or D. So it's either those two, be a process of elimination. Yeah, I think if we, yeah, went Google and then images, I think we searched around for a bit, but then this was the image that came up that was good. So we can see that here there's the two mail servers and it's talking about the protocol that is used in between the servers. So that's SMTP and then between the server and the receiver or the, the server and the client. And when you talk client, it doesn't matter whether it's a sender or receiver, then it's POP3 or IMAP are the protocols that are used. This one could have taken people, uh, I guess, a little bit of time to maybe read some of the articles and really understand the different protocols. Columbus, what port number does unsecured IMAP utilize? Uh, from the last question, we know that IMAP is a, uh, a protocol used in emails. This one, out of these ports, none of these stuck out in my mind kind of clearly. So I had to Google each of these ports for this one. So port was it 993 the imap over ssl tls so ssl tls usually would mean that it's secured because we we this is like what we talk about when we're talking about the difference between http and https so you could get this one because it fits imap uh, you don't lose points for for failing the first one but this isn't what the question is asking the question is asking for unsecured so we need to find the the matching port Good thing with port numbers is generally with port numbers, they'll be kind of similar either in how they look or even the numbers. So HTTP is a bad example because that's like port 80 and then port 443. For some of the other protocols, usually they try and match them up. So my next guess would be to like look at what 143 is. So we get IMAP, server typically listens on port 143. So that would be my answer for this one. Yeah, so unsecured IMAP is on port 143. Um, do you agree? Workers in a company branch office must visit an initial web page and click the I agree button before being able to set the web. Which of the following is this an example of? Is it A, AUP, B, MOU, C, SLA, or D, EULA? Uh, unless, you know, you just can remember these acronyms and Google will be your first point of uh, reference. The answer is AUP. If you know what AUP is, is it an acceptable user policy? I think this is kind of left field. So I think this would be like a, a process of elimination one. EULA, end user license agreement, probably not that. Uh, SLA, service level agreement. And then MOU, memorandum of understanding. Yeah, three other ones kind of come up straight away. So we go AUP policy. Yeah, and there we get it, acceptable use policy. So I should mention that it's probably a good idea to kind of, um, if you don't know what these acronyms are, just you know, do a Google search and, and start the process of elimination that way. I, yeah, I struggle with this on invalidation as well. AUP didn't stick out immediately. I, I actually put EULA first, I think. All right, widescreen. Which parameter must be adjusted to enable a jumbo frame on a network device? Google in so many of these. Specify the MTU parameter. So, yeah, B for this one. That was right, correct? Yeah, so wouldn't have been speed. That doesn't make sense. TTL is time to live. And duplex is the communication method. So yeah, M MTU. I don't even know. What does MTU stand for? Maximum trans is it transmission or transmissible unit. Yeah, is that right? What's that? Transmission unit. Yeah. So what does LSAS stand for? Um, again. Well, let's see if we type it up in Google and see if it comes up. Yeah, we're not getting any sort of uh, adventure with LSAS. It's pretty straightforward. Those ones are nice. Easy, single point. What does APT stand for? I didn't have any complaints, but I guess it could be a difficult one to search for if you didn't know. But if you, I guess you're doing a CTF. So yeah, if you typed APT, it kind of leads you in the right direction. But to really get it, you needed cyber. And that gives you the answer. So it's advanced persistent threat. Looking back on this now, this is probably one where I could have put a better keyword in here. There was still 21 solves. So whether that's just from people's knowledge or, or not, I, I guess like it is kind of a, a general cyber knowledge uh, acronym. Right. So what kind of endpoint do you tend to find the NTDS .dit file? This was Desi's question. Again, being new to the industry, it's that is it, you know, is the directory, the Azure directory, 
is it an endpoint? When you search for it, uh, one of the Google ones, you could drop it down. What is the location? When you just read the page, you kind of like look at AD. What is the DIT file in the Active Directory? But if you drop down here, the endpoint that we're kind of looking for is domain controller. So a bit of a trickier one. Again, like this is one of the questions though that you didn't have, you couldn't fail it. So you couldn't have too many answers. So if you tried Active Directory, doesn't matter. Uh, if you then go and do some more research and got domain controller. What does the LSAS process do? A, it's responsible for providing Active Directory database lookups, authentication and replication. B, it's responsible for providing Active Directory database storage and replication. C, it's responsible for providing Active Directory database reclassification. Or D, it's responsible for, for providing Active Directory database in SharePoint. So I just Googled LSAS and then what is it used for? So it's a security authority subsystem. It's responsible for enforcing security policy on the system. A bit more background. So it's often targeted by adversaries because you can dump password hashes from LSAS. So if we look back at here, so authentication would kind of house the passwords. Replication would be between endpoints or the domain controller or something like that. Like it's not necessarily immediately obvious out of these options from what we just read. So if we looked at here, it's not really doing storage. It's not doing reclassification. And then it's got nothing to do with SharePoint. You could read a bit more about LSAS, but the answer for this one is is A. I think even if you guessed something, you like you wouldn't find anything to do with reclassification and you wouldn't find anything to do with SharePoint. So even if you guessed B, because you're like, oh, maybe it does storage and replication. Uh, and got that wrong, your next guess would then be A for this one. So um, yeah, A was the correct answer. There's the parent process of LSAS.exe. A uh, simple Google search uh, reveals very quickly that LSAS, its parent process is Winit.exe. Towers of knowledge. How many technique verticals are in the enterprise MITRE attack matrix? And then you just need to enter a number. So for this one, we needed to head to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, and then it asked for enterprise in the question. So enterprise was there. I'm gonna go to enterprise, and then it's asking for technique verticals. So these are the, the techniques that exist under each one, and so it's asking for how many verticals there are. So if you just count across three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So the answer for this one was 14. Weigh in, select a potential initial vector. A, phishing email, B, process injection, C, reverse shell, D, run mimicats. So I, I basically did a Google search on what is um, an example, or what is a, an initial vector, sorry. Uh, we should have made it initial access because it's, it's one of the verticals in the minor attack. I think that the next step would be though to like Google each of these, right? So reverse shell would have been knocked out because if you looked up reverse shell initial vector, reverse shell abilities can be acquired through phishing emails or noxious sites, which puts phishing email before a reverse shell. So that would have knocked out that one. Yeah, I apologize to the people that play this. Still got 20 souls, but yeah, this would have been a tough one to Google just the keywords without knowledge. So what, it, what it's asking for is initial access is which is also known sometimes as the adversary's initial vector into a network. But if you went back to MITRE ATT&CK and if we'd worded it correctly and you looked under initial access, phishing is one of them. If you look through the rest of these, none of the rest are uh, in that. So the answer for this one was A, but that was, that was a tough one. What are ethernet frames less than 64 bytes referred to? Uh, I know through validation, we, we did change this one. Um, I forget what it originally said but it didn't, again, it was one of those ones that was hard to Google. But if you do Google the question now, you get what it is. They're called run frames. Uh, so D was the answer for picture. All right, cake. Which of the following describes the process of a layered protective measures in the network to protect valuable data and information? Is it A, the acceptable use policy, B, least privilege, C, defense in depth, or D, zero? If you were sort of approaching this from a, without any prior sort of knowledge, 
and we go Googling and see what the results come up with. Again, or you could go through and eliminate these. Acceptable use policy was a previous question, so this would be knocked out. Then you'd be looking between least privilege, zero trust, and defense in depth. But yeah, nice easy Googleable one. Victim, you suspect that your server has been a victim of a web-based attack. Which of the following ports would most likely be seen in the logs to indicate the attack's target? Oh, I think I had to read this one a couple of times because this is one of those comp TIA exam questions that just does your head in when you read it. Yeah, I think it, it's B, right? Like it, it's asking for the the web base. Yeah, web based attack. So port twenty one is FTP. Yeah, three three eight nine is RDP. Three eight nine. 389's LDAP, yeah. 3389 is RDP for sure. And then 443 is HTTP, HTTPS for that port. Yep. So it's asking for a web based attack, so it's looking for B. Okay, slightly long question. Um, Desi was replace, replacing a client security device um, that protects their screen subnet. The client has an application that allows external users to access the application remotely. After replacing the devices, the external users cannot connect remotely to the application anymore. Which of the following devices was most likely misconfigured and is now causing the problem? Is it A, the content filter, B, DHCP, C, DNS, or D, the firewall? So again, my first thought process would be um, sort of, if, if you knew what A, B, C were, then you would know that it's not either of them. I think the first step here is to obviously figure out what um, A is um, on Google. Yeah, so con content filter is an interesting one, right? Like keywords in here is security device. Immediately like B and C, right? They're, they're protocols. So they're immediately knocked out. They, it can't be one of those. So it has to either be a content filter or a firewall. You could just brute force this and guess because um, you don't get any penalty for the two. You read content filtering, it's restricting what users can access in the internet, not what applications can remote into an environment. Whereas a firewall can be set up to allow like VPN access into a network. I think that's the key in understanding this question between the two. Cause, cause I would say that a content filter is still a security device. It's just not a security device that allows remote connections in. It's only filtering what the users see outside of their network. I laughed at this, like the the most in capitals. This is such such an exam question where it's just like, hey, we're giving you one or more answer that's correct, but you have to pick the right one. <laughs> but yeah, five points for that one and victim at least. They were they were a bit tougher. But subnetting, gross. So what is the network ID associated with the host located at 192.168.0.123? slash 29. All I did with this was I copied this because I knew these existed. But I think if you go IP calculator, subnet calculator, it's what we want. We want the network address. So it's 192.168.0.120, uh, which was A. So A was the correct answer. But I will, I will come back here just for a sec and kind of explain what I was doing. So there's different types of network classes. We're not going to worry about that for now. What I was doing was you paste in the IP address. So this was the IP address, the slash 29. So slash is what's called CIDR notation and the CIDR is 29. And that's the subnet here that we wanted to select. So we wanted to go this. The, the mask is what is applied to the IP address to get the network ID. Yeah, we have our IP address. The network address is 120, which is kind of like the first address in that range for the slash 29. And then the usable host range is this. So you, if you had a subnet of this range, you could have endpoints or Windows machines or Linux machines within that environment that can have any of these IP addresses. What the question was after was the network address, which was the 192.168. 0.120. All right, so now we're, we're moving to the digital forensics questions. The way these were designed was we had kind of like a scenario that I, I just like ran a few things on a, a Windows VM. I took an image and then I ran CAPE on that image. 
and I pulled out all the evidence. And then with the questions I we just provided, the ability to download the evidence and we're asking questions on the evidence. So there was no kind of like technical skills required to get any of the evidence. It was just purely interpreting. And we wanted to try and make it as researchable as possible uh, with the questions. And I think uh, each piece of evidence had like two or three questions to it. And the first one in the series had the evidence attached to it. So we'll go into this first one. I'll, I'll just download this and then I'll open it up. But um, yeah, do you want to take this one, um, Leah? First question. Uh, one of our team is investigating an insider threat. Seems like not much of a big deal, but it's suspected an IT support admin is stealing test answers for high school students and then selling them. This is a pretty serious accusation, so we will need some help looking at the evidence. Since you're new, I am, <laughs> we're going to get to validate get to validate the evidence first and then look at some of the artifacts. Looking at the text file remote underscore support dot zero zero one dot txt, what software was being used to create the file? So obviously download the txt file and from there at the so at the very top, the answers revealed to us at the very top. For this one as well, uh, you could remove the R's and still enter and get the correct answer. So it had two answer keys to get correct. You could do access data, FTK image R 4.7.1.2, or you could include, you could literally just copy and paste out and you would get the same answer. Uh, let's jump into remote support image info two. So the first two paragraphs for all these questions were just the same. What we're looking for is this last piece. So looking again at the same text file, it looks like Desi has left a note for us. What does the note say? So if we look in here, we can see notes. Hope you can handle this with the exclamation mark. This preamble in here is all the case data that you can put in when you use Access Data FTK Imager. FTK Imager is a free program that you can download and play with yourself. You can take images of your own system, you can capture memory, you can look at evidence. It's really useful for when you're doing CTFs. This text file is just kind of like the metadata of everything that's taken the image. So when I took the image, because it was, I selected a raw image type and it was a VM. These are all the files that it creates for the VM. And then it gives you like a whole bunch of information around this size and verification times and everything else. but. Yeah, a quick rundown, I guess, on what that is. But Leo, number three. Looking at the text file, remote underscore support dot zero zero one dot txt, confirming the data source hasn't been changed can be done through the hash checksums. What are the checksums available to us to check? The checksums, if you, I suppose, control F, which I did um, for checksum, uh, you got the sort of a highlighted checksum um, and essentially that's the answer right there. Again, no harm because you can't fail on these ones. You could just keep en entering data. This is a little over the shop, but remote four. So again, looking at the same file out of interest, how long did it take for the acquisition? Now I saw that there was like six souls for this and I was just like, yes, this, this question's good. And then someone got stumped because there actually was a mistake in this question. And I apologize. Here is the acquisition time here, how long it took, which is a, the answer would be zero, zero, colon, one, zero, colon, one, zero. So 10 minutes and 10 seconds. Originally, what I'd done was the verification start and finish, which is 16 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, and I didn't realize until it was like the seventh person solving this because apparently the first six people tried this and then they're like, that's wrong. And then went and got the verification things and then didn't report it and were just like, just moved on. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, something that we missed in, in validation, but yeah, it wasn't, wasn't too bad. I guess cause you can't fail. It's fine. After the seventh person person reported it though, I did add a additional flag. So you could enter either 10 minutes and 10 seconds or 16 minutes and 30 seconds. Cause I was like, if you're doing math, you get points. Yes. Uh, uh, so same question. We've now mounted the image that we took and use Cape 
to pass the evidence. Take a look at the console log and tell me what the what target and module was used in the command line. I think just just while Leo is having a look at the question and looking through this, the only other thing to add here would be so it's asking what the target and module was used in the command line. So you would need to know kind of what the options or switches are that can exist within a command line to kind of know what you're looking for and, and how to do it. We went back and forth on this and I think like you could you could Google command line structures and there was like a Microsoft uh, blog that they put out on it. Uh, they called it options and from my experience, I just call them switches. But that kind of explained how command lines take in variables, which is essentially what this is, is you, it's asking for the variables. Yeah, so the console, all the console log is, is it's the, when cape is running, um, and a lot of legitimate executables do this because it's good for like error checking. Like we can see here, there's some inf is information, wrn's warning, er is error. So you can kind of go through and see if you weren't watching your computer while this is running, because it took 16 minutes and 30 seconds to validate something else. Like, I don't think Cape took that long. I think Cape took like three minutes. But so it's asking for command line. And then it's asking, if you look through command line, um, it does T source, T destination. So that's where you're taking evidence from and putting it in. It's asking for target. So this is the first one. So exclamation stands underscore triage. And then the next one it's asking for is module which is exclamation mark, easy parser. Here is where I'm talking about the switches or options. So in this case, a switch or an option starts with a tack tack or two dashes. And then the value after is the variable that's inside that option or switch. As we can see here, like sometimes you may have a option or switch and it may have a variable and then a space and then another variable. That could mean that the optional switch has two variables in it, or it might be comma separated. The important thing to know is just like what denotes a option or a switch. But in this case for K, each switch or option only has one variable inside it, whether that's a file path, kind of a drive letter, or in this case, the, the target and modules are specific to K. So yeah, that would have been the answer. So target was, exclamation sans underscore triage and then uh, module was exclamation easy parser all right six the team's investigating a pretty serious accusation uh, looking again at the console log what was the drive map letter assigned to the image um, so if we open the text file again we would see yeah in the top line, uh, but then one down. So line number two, there's a, there's an E drive there, I believe. Yeah. So this one in the command line, uh, you could go look up, I, I guess this is familiarity with Kate, but T source is where the evidence is coming from. And then T test is where we're saving the parse data. So the mount would have been at E. Yeah, one of, one of those questions, again, where it requires multiple steps in research, if you weren't familiar, to get to the answer for E. Again, process of elimination, you could just go, there's only two drive letters in this file, looking through it, and try both of them. Number seven. Have a look at the file from the registry parts. Run once keys sometimes have persistence. Even though this is an insider threat investigation, it may be interesting to look at it. What is the key path for the run once key? So again, we've got a new file. It's a CSV, so let's pop that open. What I normally do with all CSV files is I go to data, click filter, so I can filter on the things, and go view, and I, I freeze the top line. Uh, and then it's asking for run once keys. So if you didn't know which column it was in, you can search for run once. So we find here it's in description. We could also go find all and have a look at all of them. So there's only two and it's in the key path on the other one. So this is the only line, line 177 is the only line that has run run once in it. And then the question, if we go back to, not there, to Firefox, uh, the question is, what's the key path that's asking for? So in here, we've got the key path just here root backslash Microsoft backslash Windows backslash current version backslash run once. So if you copied that out, 
That was your answer for number seven. Number eight. Um, one of our teams investigating previous accusation, the master file table is an excellent way to see what files are on the system and even some that have been deleted. <laughs> um, have a look at the past MFT. What is the first file that exists on the system? I always like asking this one because it's like a, a nice, easy one. So I, the reason that I like doing this uh, is you can then filter on things like the created column. So if you go smallest to largest, the first file, it's like a self-licking ice cream. The first file in the MFT is the MFT itself because it has to reference itself right at the front. Uh, so the answer to this was $MFT. All right, so using the MFT pars CSV again, one of the quick wins is to see what might be in a user download folder. Can you find all XE files and list them from earliest creation time uh, using the created 0x10 timestamp to most recent? So this is where you have to look at these columns. So this is the created 0x10 column. Uh, and then it wanted earliest. Yeah, earliest to most recent. So earliest will be at the top. And then the parent directory. We don't know what the user's name is, but we want the downloads directory. So if I search download, so users public, public exists on all Windows systems. That's probably not it. App data is a good indication that it's an active user on the, on the box. But if we untick this, then I think users, user downloads. We kind of just want to hit all directories with downloads in it. Uh, the other thing you could do is do like a control F. Once you've figured this out, you could do a control F and search all for users, user downloads, uh, and that'll show you all the lines with that in it. But I just realized this is now also an okay method to do because there's not that many in the parent directory. The other thing that it wanted was it wanted exe files only. So if we untick that and go exe for extensions, so we've got seven here. So what it wanted you to do was enter builder, keygen, lb 3 d LB3 decryptor, LB3 underscore pass, team viewer, 7-zip installer, and then the LB3 XE. That was the answer for this question. Lots of steps in this to get to this answer. I think all the keywords were there in the question. It just required quite a lot of thought to get to this point. And that's why this one was worth 20 points for the question. Oh, we should have gave the subnetting question like 40 points. Question 10, uh oh, this looks like they might be planning something more serious. Based on the file path, what variant of ransomware is on the system? Um, as asking for the variant name, kind of all one word is the hint here for the format. I know, so interestingly enough, this stumped people who had done cyber for a while or like have been in the industry and kind of knew some of the ransomware variants because they tried to answer the actual name rather than reading the question and, and basing it on the file path. Uh, which was interesting. If we looked at the file path for all this, the only file path that sticks out is lockbit 30. So the answer was lockbit 30. What this is referring to is uh, lockbit 3.0, which is a variant of ransomware. Uh, and that's what some people were trying to enter. But what I wanted was just, hey, if you can get lockbit 30, that, that's what we're doing. If you then Googled that, even just lockbit, because I don't think the question... Yeah, so here's Lockbit 3.0, but it's it's a ransomware. So that's what we were trying to hint at, that this could be worse than it seems uh, being ransomware. 11, 11 was hidden until you got 10. So if you didn't see 10 on your question list, that was why it was the only question that was hidden, only because it kind of hinted at the answer to the previous one. So based on the last question, what time was lb3.exe created on the system? We can go back to the MFT. LB3 was the last file that we were talking at. And we can go across to created timestamp. And uh, this was the answer that it was looking for. So 10.02.30 AM. I think someone had an issue with this question and I can't remember whether I did anything to fix it. Oh, I know what it was. There was a double space. Yeah, so uh, apolo we'll leave this in, in the video. And apologies for people that... It, it was one of those weird ones as well that people had solved it, didn't have an issue with it. And I wonder... 
Yeah, so if you if you copied it directly from the CSV, it has a double space. But if you typed it out, it only had a single space. And it was, yeah, I added an additional flag to capture both, which was interesting because when I validated this, I copied it. So I didn't try and type it out and I didn't even notice there was a double space. Weird errors that you get through doing CTFs. Um, but that was the answer to that one. And then last question. All right, this is bad. We're going to have to tell the client one last thing. The other analysts think the IT admin was testing the ransomware on the laptop. We want to be proactive and look for a ransom note file name across the school's IT systems. Can you find the file name in the MFT without the file extension? Hint, this may require some Googling to figure out what these files are normally named. This was a tricky one, it kind of required some OSINT. If you, so we know that it's Lockbit now, like as, as a ransomware. So if we go uh, ransomware note, and then let's, let's see if this one leads us to it. But if we click on this one, Kaspersky, what we're looking for is kind of like a picture or something of the ransom note, because we, we want something to pivot off. Yeah, I think this was a blog that I originally read. So if we scroll down to here, we see that there's kind of like a string dot readme dot text. If we're looking for a ransom note, we probably want to look for something similar to that, particularly with Lockbit, because that's what this blog's about. So if we head back to the MFT and we want to clear, um, I just want to do a control find and let's look up readme. And I'm just going to do a find all because I, Readme is common. We would expect, like we're seeing it right here, readme.md. So I'm expecting to find a fair few readme files. But luckily we can look down the value column here and just have a look for anything that kind of sticks out uh, within this. This one, this kind of sticks out, right? Random string dot readme dot link. Nothing else kind of readme sum is at the back here. The rest of these look like legit. If we go to some of these as well, that's got, you can look at the parent pass, like that's got to do with access data. But if we come to this one, this is sitting in app data, uh, recent. So if you then Google this path, you would know that when a user clicks on something or opens something, a link file is created within this fault, within this parent folder structure. So we don't know what the extension is. Like this could be a .exe, it could be a dot. DLL, it could be a .msi, it could be whatever, but we know from the blog that it's most likely a .text and the question's not asking for the extension anyway. So all we needed to do was copy out this and that was your answer. So the random strings dot read me. Um, and that's how you got to that one. Being the last question of the CTF, it was kind of a few steps to get to there with some OSINT, but if you did get there, there was there was seven solves. So yeah, congrats to, uh, to all those people that got it. Yeah, really good effort. That brings us to the end of all the questions. I don't like it. There was definitely mistakes on our part uh, with some of the validation that we tried to fix, but uh, do you have anything else to add, I guess, Leo, with your experience creating it? Kind of any of the questions you want to talk through again? Oh, yeah, no, I um, certainly had a lot of fun participating, but also creating for the very first time. Um, and I think, as I've mentioned before, being completely new to digital forensics, probably a few more extra steps for me to take, um, to be able to sort of understand things. Um, but no, overall it's, um, really good. Um, I, I do agree that we probably could have maybe spent more time validating certain, especially with spellings. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, yeah, apologies for that. Um, but, um, but either way, you know, it's, it's great to see kind of everyone participate too, have a go and, and all that sort of thing. I think we had, was it 30? Did you Are we had 27. There's a few people that just like got a few points on the board and I hope it was lack of time and you didn't get disheartened. We did have the moderator channel though. So if you'd want to jump on discord, you could have asked questions and we would have tried to give a few hints without giving it away. But yeah. Okay. Maybe just a subnetting and they just, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no subnetting <laughs> for the next CTF yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was also nice to see like a few people play throughout the weekend so just looking at at the scoreboard like there was quite a few play straight up on the friday then a few people joined on like the saturday i think there was one two on the sunday i had two players on the sunday play so yeah it was good 
All right, everyone, thanks for sticking with Leo and I. We had a lot of fun putting this together, even though it was so short to put it together and with all the mistakes that we had. It's definitely something that I, I want to do next year. Maybe sync it up with a conference that doesn't have a CTF and we'll spend a bit more time kind of putting it together. Leo's will have 12 months in the industry under his belt by then, I'm sure. So he'll be getting on to some harder questions. And hopefully anyone who wants to come and join, um, that was the point at Adelaide Sec. I had a workshop. I had a good turnout. But if we run it for a longer period of time to develop it, maybe I, we get some more people to help help jump in and create some questions thanks to everyone that played uh congratulations to the winners thanks so much leo for helping as always the best way to support at the moment is to subscribe to the podcast and like and subscribe to the youtube channel obviously uh, at the moment i've also got some merch the cypher coin which is still unsolved for the discord server is available at shop.hardlyadequate.com and as well as all other content write-ups Links to the Discord, podcast, or YouTube channel is can all be found from hardlyadequate.com. But thanks everyone, and catch you all next time.